Hello to you all, Peter here, and welcome to our Travel Through Time YouTube page. Quick introduction to today's conversation, which is with Tom Whipple, who is the science correspondent of The Times and the author of this book, The Battle of the Beams. Uh, subtitle is The Secret Science of Radar That Turned the Tide of World War II. It's a bit of World War II history, a story which is perhaps not as well known as it should be, but it's one of absolutely the highest importance. Um, we're talking about one year in that story today and here is the conversation I had just the other day. Hope you enjoy it. Tom Whipple, welcome to Travels Through Time. Really looking forward to talking to you about your wonderful new book, uh, Battle of the Beams, today. But first off, I wanted to tell you that long before your book arrived, um, your particular fame had um, preceded it in our household, at least, because during the COVID pandemic, due to your job at The Times, um, you were decoding the bewilderment of that very strange moment in time for our family. I'm sure many of us as well. But the refrain Tom Whipple says um, was echoing around um, these rooms that you can see behind you. My wife was uh, particularly uh, keen on it in 2020. That was just one thing that you've reported on at the time. So can you tell us a little bit about this fascinating job of yours, please? Um, thank you. I mean, that's very fr flattering. First of all, it was a very strange period for all of us. And I think we all learned a lot on the fly. Um, so, yeah, I am I am the science editor at The Times. Um, the first thing to say is I don't edit. Um, I don't know why I'm called the science editor. I'm, I'm the science writer, the science correspondent, the science reporter. So take your pick. Um, but it's, to my mind, the, the best new, the best job on news in a newspaper um, and the only job on news that I want to do because it's just so varied. I mean, I literally have the whole of the human enlightenment project available to me to write about. So it is, you know, it is archaeology to zoology. Uh, it's a bit to be journalistic about it. Um, and uh, it's marvellous because every day, I have a bunch of scientists who've got new research out who um, are there on the other end of a phone to tell me about it, to tell me about their, their life's work. And it might be something in, you know, particle physics that's extremely hard to understand, or it might be something funny that a chimpanzee has done today. And and all of those are, are great. And that's that's what keeps me coming in, into the office, the, the privilege of talking to these uh incredibly interesting, incredibly clever people about their life's work. Well, you, you talk about the breadth of your job there, but I want to talk about something in specific, which I think um, connects with your um, own time as a student, which is mathematics. And the other, the other week, um, Rishi Sunak was telling us we all need to get back to mathematics. We need to amplify our mathematical skills. We've all lost them. This is very pertinent to your book. We'll talk about the book in a moment. But I just wanted to ask you broadly, if you feel that we've lost touch with maths as something that can help us out, maybe because, look, I'm surrounded by all this technology that does everything for me. Do I need any maths in my life anymore? It's a very, very interesting question. And you will get quite serious mathematicians who will say, look, ChatGPT can basically do a maths paper um, and we need to rethink what we need maths for. And that doesn't mean that there's, there's quite subtle things. Um, it doesn't mean we don't need maths, but maybe we don't need Victorian maths. Um, now, there's when, when you talk to mathematicians, there's, there's lots of things you hear and quite often you get this sense of a bit like Millwall, nobody likes us and we don't care. They, they 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 get all maudlin and they start talking about that old C.P. Snow two cultures thing about how you know it's all right. And Rishi Sunak says it's all right to admit that you're that you're enumerate and joke about it, but no one would joke about not being able to read. And there is truth in that. But actually, as we saw in the pandemic, lots of people are really interested in maths and really want to understand it and really value understanding it. You know, that's why they turn to Sudoku every day in the paper. Um, and maybe, and in this new curriculum, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. But quite clearly, what was needed in the pandemic was uh, an intuitive understanding of statistics. Uh, uh, you, don't, you don't need to be there solving the equation, but you need to sort of broadly have your in, in your head, an idea of, you know, what is this large number? What does that mean in terms of the context of the population? What what are sort of exponentials? And, you know, what what is rough heuristic I can use to understand numbers and just be happy with them? And sometimes you'll sp speak to, uh, I remember chatting to a Fields medalist. The Fields medalist is the highest sort of reward. It's the Nobel Prize of maths. 
And it was after there'd been one of these um, things, you know, some government minister was saying, we need more rigor, we need more, more trigonometry, more calculus, more all of these things. And he said, well, no, we don't. We, we need more things like the Fermi problem. So Enrico Fermi, the, the physicist, um, an Italian physicist came up with these this sort of class of problems, which are very much about just understanding stuff intuitively. So they're questions like, how many piano tuners are there in Bristol? Or how much water is in a cloud? And the important thing isn't getting the question right. It, it's defining this problem mathematically. So what's the population of Bristol? I don't know. Let's say it's 300,000 people. Uh, let's say there's that means there's 120,000 houses. What proportion of houses do I think have pianos? I'm going to say 5%. So you're on what sort of 6,000 houses or so with pianos. How often does a house have to be have its piano tuned? Um, let's say once a year. So and how long does that? So so, so that's one, once a year. So over the, so you've, you've got sort of what? I'm, I'm now, now my intuitive mass is going wrong. So maybe you need you need 150. Um, houses to be visited every year uh, and maybe each piano tuner takes a day so on my calculations there which I may well have got wrong to do on the you need half a piano tuner in Bristol to get to get to get round uh what's needed no that's that's ab absolute nonsense isn't it 6,000 uh well whatever so I, I proved prove the need for Fermi problems and I need to sit down with a pen and paper more than half half a piano tuner a lot more than half in energy, but that's the sort of idea. Or you know, how big is a cloud? What proportion of its water? How much water is up there? Um, and and these sorts of things are, are perhaps a far better way to go about getting getting a, a numerate and mathematically literate population. Yeah, a really good point. I was enjoying listening to you um, uh, elaborate on that then, because. Um, well, first off, it made me think that Richie Sunak was probably talking about the Victorian mathematics, this idea of everyone sitting behind tall desks and chanting the two times table or something like this. Or, um, But really, it was um, it was taking me on to the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, because I had a feeling that I was sitting back in a room with um, one of these archetypes of the Second World War period, not one of the ones that we immediately think of, like the, the tank commander, the flying ace, the general. But the boffin, the boffin is perhaps um, maybe a little bit of an overlooked Second World War character, but one which I have a, an affinity for and one that you write about splendidly in The Battle of the Beams. Without talking about any character in particular, could you tell us what I mean by that term boffin? It is a wonderful term. Interestingly, last month, the Institute of Physics said that it sent this letter to tabloid newspapers saying, stop calling them boffins, stop calling, you know, boffins discover X, boffins discover Y. I love the idea of the boffin. The boffin is the, well, it, it emerged as a term around about the Second World War. And it's this, uh, you know, let, let's be honest, normally man, although there were there were women doing it, particularly during the Second World War, when you sort of flattened these hierarchies. Um, and they're, they're the, the clever chaps in their tweed jackets with their pipes, uh, sitting down with a pen and paper and, and solving the problems, putting themselves in the mind of the Hun and, and trying to work out what's going on abroad and trying to work out how to counter it here. They, they, they are the, the fizzing nucleus of minds behind initially the war machine, and then it became, you know, science, science in general. But I think definitely you're right. The period of the boffin is, it is, it is leather patches on your tweed coats. It's, it's Uncle Quentin in Enid Blyton, if, you, if, you, if you've read that. It's, you know, it, it is these, these, um, the, these, these thinkers in, in, the, in their armchairs with their equations, uh, you know, being being at the cutting edge, somehow being at the cutting edge of science, whilst also being even then a slightly anachronistic figure. Yeah, they're kind of in time but out of time, aren't they? Which is interesting. And you can imagine yeah. them um, sucking on a cigarette and um, arguing over the number of piano tuners that might be required. <laughs> to, to be by, which, by the way, I don't, I don't know if, if, I, if I think I said six thousand pianos in Bristol. I mean, 15 pianos a day need to be done. Let's say they do one in the morning. That's, uh, what, seven and a half piano tuners. I don't know how I got to half piano tuners. We're going was... to keep returning to this throughout <laughs> it's, our it's conversation. It's going to really niggle at me. <laughs> by, by the end. And if anybody wants to contribute, we can uh, 
we might, might we might actually hear from a piano tuner in Bristol who can <laughs> he can cast a light from the real world on this. But yeah, the, the other thing is that I thought, which was kind of slightly discordant as well. Excuse him, <laughs> the musical puns here, but the the idea that um, the boffin, in a way, seems like quite an old person, dusty character. But um, as with a lot of things in the Second World War, they weren't always very old. They were often <laughs> strikingly young, and and um, so much of the action. Um, the fighting, the thinking, the decision making was done by people who to us today seem, you know, kind of barely, I mean, to, to live on your, to have your own house at the age of 30 now seems like a kind of exciting thing. But these are people making massive decisions. One of these um, characters you write about in particular, 28 year old Boffin, I'm going to get you to introduce him now because he is a character right at the heart of your book. And he's an absolutely fascinating figure in Second World War history. Can you tell us who he is, please? Yeah, he's a, he's a guy called Reginald Jones, or in that way they had then, he was known as R.V., uh, Reginald Victor, R.V. Jones. Um, and he was, as you say, he was he was 28. Um, he was given a, he was given a title at the beginning of the war, which was Assistant Director of Intelligence, brackets, science. Um, and the, the brilliant thing about this title was that he didn't really assist anyone. And he was a director of an organization that had a staff of one, which was him. Um, and uh, he had a job that uh, when he was given it, he said, a man in that position could lose the war. I'll take it. Um, and his job was effectively counterintelligence in science. It was about trying to work out what, particularly in relation to the air war, um, what the Germans were up to and trying to understand from a scientific which is weirdly, it wasn't something that was done. You know, a lot of the, the intelligence officers were classicists, but this is someone who would specifically have technical knowledge and then try to put himself in the mind of the enemy and try to work out what they were doing. And particularly at the beginning of the war with regards to the radio war. Um, now, the thing about him was um, he was, uh, I would have loved to have met him, um, exceptionally arrogant, but the most annoying thing is, is justifiably so. Um, for listeners who know, there's an element of the Richard Feynman of him. He, he enjoyed practical jokes, um, had an exceptionally high opinion of himself and was right, unfortunately, to, to do so. Or fortunately for Britain, he was right to do so. It, it, as regards, be, it, one of the best ways to, to illustrate it, as regards being a department of one, um, he wrote this... Um, paper, which was the equivalent of the, the sage minute, you know, this was government advice, where he talked about the ideal um, intelligence agency. And he, he described it as, as a place where you could have, you, you needed the fewest number of decent minds, because you, you didn't want to miss a piece of information, you wanted all of this disparate information from, you know, intelligence intercepts, from agents, for, from reconnaissance flights to come in and be assessed in one mind, ideally, you know, a small number of minds, so that you could bring together these loose threads and then form a picture. And he essentially concluded that in his department, they had reached the, the apotheosis, the ultimate intelligence agency of this, because they had one mind, and it was the best mind, and it was his mind. Um, and so th this is who he was, and he was 28, he was a physicist, he was, he, he was undoubtedly brilliant. Um, I, th I think it'd be, it'd be wrong to say, you know, he was Alan Turing brilliant, because you know, basically no one in, you know, <laughs> in post-war Britain, I think you could probably say that maybe two or three people who were Alan Turing brilliant, but but he, he, was, he was definitely brilliant and he was also extremely personable. And his particular genius, I think, was understanding how bureaucracies worked as well, understanding how to get this intelligence to the right people at the right time in such a way that it got action um, and, you know, he was quite annoying with it. That's an that's an interesting point because, in a way, uh, as you describe him, listening to you now, but also in the book as well, there's kind of two things here. It seems like he has a lack of emotional intelligence in one sense because he can be very blunt. He can put, uh, he can ruffle feathers. He can, he has that slight. Um, I am being quite general here, but maybe scientists do tend to see things in black and white a little bit, and um, occasionally can be a bit dogmatic about their point of view in conversation, for example. Something that we see with him here. But at the same time, you say he has this kind of instinct for subtlety that he understands systems. And when you're working in um, um, 
in government, I mean, not it's not as bad as today when it's really, I mean, processes and systems all over the place today. But, but back then, it was still there were still people that you had to, you kind of make your little alliances with um, to make work. He seems to be able to do both of those things, which is maybe slightly curious. He's not he's not completely alienating everybody, is he? No, he is selectively alienating people. Um, you occasionally come across that. I've, I've had the real pleasure of, and the reason this book works is because he's a brilliant writer and he's happy to be a brilliant writer in official documents. Um, to, to, a, a, a couple of slight asides that I think illustrate this. There's one paper he's writing about the, the existence of, of radar and, and, you know, whether the, um, uh, and the, on in the German side and the extent of their technological knowledge. And this should be a very dry scientific paper. He writes the thing as a play in which the dramatis personae are members of the, the Nazi cabinet. You know, it is it's not a very good play. And there's an absolutely furious note in the margin in the National Archives where they just say, this is not appropriate. And, and, and the person adds, you know, you know, if he must do it as a play, basically, can can all the characters, the Nazi characters, not be ciphers for for Reginald Jones's opinions? Um, and there's another marvellous one where some poor member of, and this is an example of abrasiveness, some poor member of the HR, basically their version of the HR department, uh, which you can imagine in civil service, had given him some form to fill out about his employees. And one of the characters was, by the stage he had got employees, was personality and force of character. And you know, most people would just put a number on a scale of one to ten. But he replied, he objected to the idea that these were the same thing. And he said, you know, basically that these are, are orthogonal characteristics. And he says, it is impossible to mark as a single assessment. If I had any faith in the pro forma, I should believe that all my staff are schizophrenic. And, you know, he's awful. But then equally, he has this whole bit where he goes into when is the appropriate time to give intelligence? You know, you can give it too early when it's raw intelligence, which is obviously what your superiors would want. But then they come to not trust it. Um, uh, but, you know, you're the guy, you're the dog that barks too early. So you often have to hold this stuff back. But then when you, if you give it too late, obviously, that's bad as well. Um, and and he, was, he was clearly working through the psychology of how to, in his view, do this job best, which is get the proper intelligence noticed and actioned. And he had plenty of examples how, of how often it wasn't noticed and actioned. Um, but his problem was he wrote this in the document. He wrote this to his superior saying, you know, I will not be the guy, the dog that barks early. He basically said, you're idiots. Um, I can't trust you with this stuff until I can trust you with this stuff. So, so trust me with this stuff. Um, but he was right, you know, to an extent, maybe not his superiors, but the bureaucracy was idiotic. Um, a great example is German radar. So we were told we were literally told by a German officer in 1937. He basically turned up. It was one of these things where they, they have, you know, away days with the opposite numbers. And, and he turned up and said, ha ha, how is your radar going? We have radar as well. It wasn't quite that, but it was basically that. Um, and then in 1939 on a German battleship, uh, you know, we, we said this is a scrap metal we bought. Britain bought the battleship for scrap metal. It was in Uruguay and pretended for a front company. And someone was sent on, an agent was sent on to look at the battleship uh, and found radar. Um, and, you know, there, there are several examples. Then, then a bit a month earlier, there was a in massive intelligence leak called the, the Oslo Report, in which the Germans described having radar. Um, it would be a, two years, a year and a half, before it was accepted that the Germans had radar. And this is after having captured radar been told there was radar and had an intelligence leak describing radar. So bureaucracies then were as silly as they are now. Yeah, I know that they are. And you're but you're just reminding me. And this is so I mean, I'm off on a bit of an aside here myself, but I'll I'll allow myself it because I remember James Lovelock talking about science and progress and how you know, if you look at the, the the kind of pace of knowledge and the reception of knowledge, there's two completely different strands of knowledge. So if you actually look at when we first understood things like microwaves or whatever, and when you actually see them in the, su the supermarket, when the technology gets taken to market, um, I, I think there's something in that, which is about the paradigm shifts between how do you take a person from 
And, and this is so pertinent to today, isn't it? When you're thinking about how do you change people's worldviews and people, you have to wait, wait till people are ready. But the whole thing about war is it sometimes accelerates that process, which might otherwise play out over decades. It has to be because there's there's so much at stake. And um, we could talk about that. And I'd love to talk to you more about that. Um, maybe we will one day. But today we do have some business at hand. And this is our format. And you've um, willingly agreed to uh, take us on to a bit of a tour into the past, which is where we we pick a year and you take us to three moments in the year, which tell something of a story in themselves. And I mean, you've got a great year. You've got a great character. Um, I think when you put all of this together, it's going to be a really fascinating conversation. So let's start off with the year itself. Um, I'm going to give you the question I always throw at everyone. If you could travel back through time to a calendar year, which year would you pick, Tom Whipple? Well, I am, I think, I think probably unsurprisingly, given the context, I am picking 1940 um, and I am picking the home front and I'm picking the... Uh, the genesis of our our radio war and our radio countermeasures. Well, 1940, Blitzkrieg, Fall of France, Battle of Britain, the Blitz, Chamberlain's Fall, Churchill's Rise. It's also the year at the centre of your book and this story of the Battle of the Beams, isn't it? Um, let's just talk a little bit about science at this moment, though, because the Second World War really was... Um, a moment of um, scientific terror, wasn't it? We'd had this thing with H.G. Wells and the, the coming of the bomber in the 1930s with the idea of all these super weapons which were going to um, like kind of vaporise people in death rays and all sorts of things that seem very science fiction-y to us now, but probably were a lot more alarming to people at the time you write about this. Um, a really important point to note, though, uh, in um, 1940, um, is that Germany were generally a little bit ahead um, of, well, at least where we thought they were, because he's, as you say, we hadn't quite absorbed um, the clues that we'd been presented with, but they had some extraordinary clever minds working on their um, their scientific programme, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Um, and there was, I think there was an element of chauvinism in Britain where we believe we had the, you know, Blighty had the plucky minds that had had alone come up with things like radar and, and all these super weapons. But you're right. So there was there were several parallel strands. Um, Stanley Baldwin gave this famous speech where he said the bomber will always get through. Um, and I think in the 1930s there was very much an idea that a bit like how we now look at nuclear weapons, um, the there was no defence against the bomber. And the only defence was to have your own bomber force. So it was this mutually assured destruction of bombers. Um, separately, there was this new, relatively new science of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, in the you know, late Victorian period, we, we'd come to appreciate that the, the light that you can see is this tiny sliver of the light that is. And, you, you know, there's, there's microwaves, there's x-rays, there's radio waves. Um, and there was this idea that within this spectrum, there was hiding somehow a super weapon, and you had this this race to find a death ray. Uh, there must be a death ray, and the, the MOD. You know, we, there was even this contest to see could you raise the temperature of a sheep at a hundred yards by a degree or something like this, and then. Lots of people, there were people who swore that they could. There were, there were a bunch of charlatans and snake oil salesmen who, who claimed that using radar, radio, you could. Um, this eventually came across the desk of, of actual proper scientists who did the not, not difficult calculation to show that this just isn't feasible. Um, you know, there's no way of getting that much energy and then projecting it as radio. But almost as an aside, one of them said, but, you know, this doesn't mean that this isn't useful. It's not escaped our notice that these radio waves would bounce back off things that are metallic in the sky, and maybe we could use this to spot planes. Um, and this was part of, this was an interesting insight into the, the Stanley Baldwin's bomber will always get through, because if the bomber isn't going to get through, if there's going to be a way to defeat the bomber, you have to see where the bomber is. And there were several schemes to do that. There, if you go to Kent today, there's still these polished concrete mirrors, which were sound weapons, not sound weapons, sound detectors, 
And they were there to pick up the sound of approaching bombers. Um, they didn't work terribly well for two reasons. First of all, sound travels only about twice as fast as a bomber, so you don't get much warning. Um, secondly, they, they got into interrupted by the milkmen on their rounds nearby clinking their glasses. Um, but there were other schemes. There's a scheme called silhouette, which the idea was you would use big searchlight to light up clouds, and then you'd have fighters flying above the clouds who would see the silhouettes of the bombers below and swoop down like sort of sharks and take them out. Um, and there were people looking at infrared, another part of the spectrum. In fact, Reg Reginald Jones was looking at, at infrared. Um, but it was radio and radar that 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 won through in in the uk and in germany and we produced chain home which was an amazing radar defense um that you know really helped win to a significant degree the battle of britain um the germans of radar too they didn't they particularly didn't concentrate on integrating it in the way that we did in, in the idea that you the, the the big genius of chain home was that it wasn't so much the radar, it was that this information went to central clearing hubs and you had ways of using it fast. Um, the Germans were less interested, but then they were fighting an offensive war rather than a defensive war. They didn't need radar in the way that we did because they didn't intend to, to be invaded. Uh, they intended to do the invading. Um, and what they had was something that is fascinating. I think not a lot of people know about, certainly people I've spoken to. Um, they essentially had the first precision bombing device. Um, at the beginning of the war, they were using beams, radar be radio beams, to guide their bombers to the target. Um, now, this this is actually it's, it's a marvelous thing when you hear about how it works. You think, how does that work? Um, if you imagine you've got a torch, which is just you know light radar, ra radio is light, um, and you shine the torch very rapidly, it produces a cone. Um, so if you wanted it to be narrow, it's narrow at the beginning, but very, very rapidly, it's spread everywhere and it's pretty useless. Um, what the Germans did was they had two torches, two torches of radio, and they got the cones of them to just slightly graze. And one of them was transmitting dot, 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 dot. And the other one was transmitting dash, 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 dash. And at the grazing points, the two came together, and all you heard was continuous boo. You heard the continuous note with the dots filling the dashes. And if you were flying down that, you knew if you heard the dash, you had to turn left. You knew if it, you heard the dot, you had to turn right. And then you stayed on the, the beam with the continuous note. And when you heard a second beam, a cross beam, which was exactly the same principle, the dots and dashes, uh, but a continuous note in the middle, when you heard the continuous note in that, then you were over your target. The, the, the Germans had found a way to paint a cross over the target, and it was literally X marks the spot. You release the bombs, and away you go. And in um, 1940, say at the moment when Churchill was replacing Chamberlain in Downing Street in May 1940, that very famous moment in British history, there was no conception of this at all. So let's go to your first scene which I think is a wonderful moment of drama, a moment of personality, but it's maybe a moment of realisation more than anything else. Do you want to tell us um, what it was and what happened, please? So this is the 21st of June, 1940, um, and it's at about 10.30 a.m., and it should have been at about 10 a.m. Um, Reginald, because he, he ran the department by himself, um, he kept his own hours, and he never saw any point in turning up before 10. Um, but he turned up at 10 this morning and there was a note for him to go to Downing Street, which he initially thought was a practical joke. He got uh, he shared a secretary with someone else and the two regularly played practical jokes on each other. Um, and he eventually got her. She, she was she was adamant. This is not a practical joke. You do need to be in Downing Street. And so he he rushed in and this this. 28-year-old arrived into the room and it was full of the most important people in Britain. There was Lord Beaverbrook, you know, Archibald Sinclair, the air minister, you've got the chief of air staff, you've got Hugh Dowding, who led fighter command, uh, Charles Portal, who was leading bomber command. And then there was uh there was Reginald. And he was he was there because effectively because of his mentor, um, Frederick Lindemann, who was uh the, the chief scientific advisor at the time had spotted Jones very early as a physicist in Oxford and been his career mentor. And 
he he sort of knew that that Jones had this idea of the beam over the preceding few months. He'd pieced together disparate strands from you know, downed pilots, from, uh, from from notebooks that had been torn up in a field by pilots who'd been shot down, um, from you know agent reports, all of these things. And, and he he comes to the conclusion they had the beams, but this was controversial. And I think probably most of the people in the room thought it wasn't possible. Um, one reason they thought it wasn't possible is because the radio beams would have had to slightly curve round the Earth to work. Um, you know, if you can you can work if if they go straight, then um, a bomber would have to be flying at forty thousand feet to receive them. So so it, it seemed implausible. There's lots that seemed implausible, um, and he effectively, you know, they they were there arguing about it, um, and. Uh, it, Jones, I, I love this bit because it's such characteristic arrogance. He, he was in this room full of important people, and he was there because he was a technical guy. And he says, you know, at last you know, Churchill turned to address a technical question to Jones. Basically, and, and Jones, as a scientific guy in the room, should have just said, oh, well, it's X, Y, Z. Um, but he said, would it help, sir, if I told you the story right from the start? And we have this. We we have this scene from several angles. We have it from Jones's accounts, but we also have it from Churchill's accounts because it it, it clearly had a big um, impression on him. And, and Churchill wrote, for twenty minutes or more, he spoke in quiet tones, unrolling his chain of circumstantial evidence, the like of which, for its convincing fascination, was never surpassed by tales of Sherlock Holmes or Monsieur Lecoq. And so you know. In that room, he he just spoke to the most important person in the land, and he just said, "Look, I know this is happening." Um, and Churchill then said, "Being master and not having to argue too much, once I was convinced about the principal pulls of this queer and deadly game." It's, it's such a Churchill phrase. It's queer and deadly game. I gave all the necessary orders that very day in June for the existence of a beam to be assumed and for all countermeasures to receive absolute priority. Well, listen, I mean. There's so much there, which is so enticing. But I also thought maybe you might have an insight as well from just from your working life as a journalist as well, because I'm sure you've been often in things like press conferences or important meetings when it's actually you want to say something. And I've often been because I'd never ask a question because I'm always too terrified, even if you know more than the people who are up on the stage talking. It takes a certain amount of courage to say that thing, but often it needs to be said so. Do you know what I mean? As I'm talking in this way, that, that, yeah, that you're yeah, in mean, that social context. But how can we, like, uh, you know, imagine what it would be like with these people, like Beaverbrook and Churchill? I mean, these are figures. This is an age which is far more deferential than today. It's far more hierarchical today. It was to some extent. I know we talk about younger people early on, but these are old grave men, gentlemen, who had probably been around in, in the last war, let alone the new war, to say something to their faces takes tremendous courage, doesn't it? It, it does. I remember when, when I first, when I was on work experience at the Times, and I sat in the morning editorial meeting where all of the big beasts joust over the stories of the day, and I realised, uh, I was absolutely petrified, and I realised midway through that I hadn't put my phone on silent. Um, and But I, I just I, I had this dilemma where I thought, well, but if I go into my pocket and try to deal with it, it'll look like I'm on my phone. So I sat there hoping it wouldn't go off in any fashion, um, but too scared to even make it so that it couldn't go off. Uh, this is pre-iPhone, so it wasn't just a sort of a flick on the side. Um, I cannot imagine what it would be like at the age of 28 to go in there and do that. All, all I can say is, I, I think it, it speaks to the character of the man um, uh, that that he he wasn't he wasn't a deferential guy, and he didn't have respect for these people. Um, he had respect for some people, but respect was 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 earned. And I, I think he had a he had a very high opinion of his own intelligence versus them, and, and you know probably rightly so. Maybe you'll get a taste of this yourself when you're at a. At a book of us, a book event at the Hay Festival, and you'll get to the end, and someone will put their hand up and say, "Actually, do you want me to tell you what the Battle of the Beams was all all about?" <laughs> I'm really? sure that will happen, <laughs> and there'll be some R.V. Jones character waiting, uh, lurking for you in the crowd. But yeah, I think it's a terrific scene. What we what we know now makes it all the more um, intriguing, really, because he was pretty bang on, wasn't he? He was, but the, the, so the fascinating thing is the thing that finally 
swung it, well, for him, the last piece of information was a paper by a scientist called Eckersley, um, which, which calculated, and he was a serious radio scientist, and he calculated that, yes, they would have curved around the Earth. But the, the amazing thing is, after this, just after this meeting, Eckersley said uh, that he didn't think they'd curve around the Earth. And Jones was like, but I used your paper. And Eckersley said, sort of recanted this thing. And then, yes, then, yes, Jones had this awful sinking feeling, and he writes about it well, where he, he thought, well, I've just gone to Churchill, who has just gone over the heads of all these people uh, on the base of what I said. And now, now the thing I based what I was saying on, it appears to be wrong. Uh, so mm. he, he, did, he did have the, these moments of yeah. fear and fear. Plenty of uh, plenty of beams shining right on uh, Jones's back at this point, I suppose. But yes. um, for your second scene, I think um, this is a, the, the perfect follow-up because, of course, a theory is nothing without proof, and um, you've got to go and test some things out. So um, let's let's uh, move on. Take the story forward. Uh, to the story forward to where, please. Well, so we are somewhere in the in midsummer in Britain in the. the cold skies above the midlands high up in a an aging anson plane which was a sort of brick and shuddery juddery thing that was one of the few things that could be spared by the raf and this is the flight that was ordered by churchill to go and listen for those beams um and they sent up um as you know, flight lieutenant bufton and an observer called corporal mackey and they weren't told what they were looking for. What they were told was to listen out for signals with Lorentz characteristics. So the the German beams weren't a completely new idea. There was a system called the Lorentz landing system, which over a short range used a similar approach to guide planes onto the right path to the land. And that's what they were looking for. And they were told to fly over Derby. Um, basically over the Midlands, where we thought, you know, if you're going to have targets, um, they're going to be over the Midlands. Um, and they were told to listen out for this. And the astonishing thing is they shouldn't have heard anything. You know, the Germans shouldn't have had their beams switched on. They weren't, they didn't have a raid that way. Um, but they had got them switched on. Um, and as Jones sat at home thinking, have I got all of this wrong? <laughs> you know, have I made a fool of myself in front of Churchill? Um, this plane flew on. Um, it took off from Cambridgeshire, it flew parallel to the coast, and it heard a series of faint dots south of Spalding. Um, and they got stronger and stronger, and then, the, then they had a continuous note lasting a few seconds, um, just the, the, the width of the beam, and then it receded to dashes. Um, and they continued flying on, and they it was you know the beam the, the the continuous note probably lasted for about 400 to 500 yards which gives you a sense of what i mean by precision bombing you know this isn't this isn't sort of you know baghdad war style that can fly down the road and turn right at the traffic lights this is it's still area bombing by modern standards but nevertheless uh 400 to 500 yards wide and then they heard a second one um and that's what they reported back they didn't they didn't find the crossing point, but by this stage, we knew the place where the beams were sighted. So you had two coordinates in Britain, and you had two coordinates in uh, Germany, in, in Northern Germany, Stolberg Hill, uh, up towards Denmark, and Cleve, um, of, you know, the Anne of Cleves. Um, and uh, from that, you can draw two lines, and you can continue them, and you can see their crossing point, and it was Derby. It was where, where the... The Rolls Royce Aero Engine Factory was, and that was clearly the target. And so, with great relief, um, Jones was vindicate, vindicated. And of course, then the question was, what to do with, do about it? Yeah, there's. Um, I think there's a lot of poetry actually in the sounds here, and you often get this with science when it really strikes you. But just repeat to us now what you said before about the noises that they would have heard because they're quite distinctive aren't they and you i think um obviously for someone who's directing a pilot of a of an aircraft this 
became second nature to them at this point these these german guiding planes who would guide bombers in with the incendiary bombs that they would drop um, yeah. what what were those noises again just remind us yeah so it's 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 a dot 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 mm -hmm. and the dash 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 they're, they're perfectly syncopated so that mm -hmm. yeah they come together in this and you can imagine them they would be hearing the dot hearing the dot knowing they had to turn right and then you'd suddenly hear this 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 continuous note and you'd know you were there and that's and for for, for context at the time british bombers were flying we had this arrogant notion that we were a seafaring nation and we knew how to navigate by the stars and of course when you're above the clouds there's always stars so they had sextants i mean they were using techniques that that you know the battle of trafalgar people would have recognized and and they worked well at the Battle of Trafalgar, but you're not going at 300 miles an hour in the Battle of Trafalgar. <laughs> um, and as it turned out, our bombers were, were almost useless. Uh, I mean, for the first couple of years of war, they, they basically hit nothing. Um, and that's because of navigation. So whereas the Germans, the Germans had a technological solution that left little to chance and didn't trust to their crews. Um, and we, we, we did the reverse. And, you know, they, when, when you're in a, serious technological war that's turns out you should go for the former yeah and i suppose it's just worth emphasizing the fact that during i mean this is something which is passed out of um our day-to-day -day life nowadays but in the early 20th century things like morse code were part of um a working framework for intellectual life when i mean i always think of that chap on the the wireless operator on the titanic like with his sos like kind of tapping it out and this idea of a different like kind of the language of um radio even though it's very rudimentary and um you know it doesn't but it was of its time wasn't it that's what i mean and yeah uh, the, these sounds you would have been very i mean it's a bit like for, for listeners who are the right age you know if you remember the the sound of a modem connecting um yeah there, there are these sounds that 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 represent the technology and they would have been they would have been okay with them you know radio r radio being a ham radio enthusiast at the time was a bit like being a computer programmer in the early 1980s or something or you know it, it was the thing that geeks did and the thing that, that geeks understood and you can guarantee that a lot of those radio operators on the planes would have come from those communities so yeah you would have been completely okay with this and you would have you would have understood what it meant and what later later meant when these things were translated onto the screens of cathode ray tubes and you'd see all of these sinusoidal waves or the blips of approaching planes. And you'd and there's some quite um, entertaining sections of the book that follow this where you have some of these amateur radio enthusiasts who are sent up in garden sheds on top of masts in <laughs> this. It's kind of almost feels bucolic, but it's not really because they're, high, they're a few <laughs> yeah. hundred feet up in the air listening to these. Um, and they're not really sure what they're doing as well, which adds a, a, like an a, an, ed, well, an extra layer of bewilderment to it. Because, I mean, it's, it's, when I get, when I talk about the poetry, what I mean is there is, you know, we're often, we're all, we are talking about war here and there was so much at stake, but the idea of shining beams through the atmosphere, invisible ones, there's something there, isn't there, which is so... So, so beguiling and there, there um, is it yeah. became a the way i way i talk about it in the book is it's a bit like the undersea world you know it started you were under the water or you were in the airways and it was a quiet place you'd fly over europe and you'd hear nothing but you start getting these different species arriving with the clicks and the whistles and and it, it, it suddenly by the end of the war, it's like snorkeling on a coral reef, and you've got all of these radio countermeasures, and you've got all of these different beams and these different, you know, hyperbolic navigation systems uh, and countermeasures and counter countermeasures and counter countermeasures, and at the same time, you've got human voices and these these farcical conversations where, where we, the British uh, started interfering with german orders with german speakers and you would get german speakers saying no don't listen to that person that person's the british and then the the, the actual german operator would say no 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 that person's you know I, i'm the real one and then they'd start swearing and you get this 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 sudden flourishing like like this like the pre-cambrian explosion of life where you, the airwaves become a place in which battle is done 
and, and but in an invisible no one knew at the time or so few people knew the ferocity of this technological war like a sixth dimension or something isn't it yeah it's a, it's a new new space for is brilliant well let's move on to the third of your three which um shows how um this is developed from the moment in june when churchill's involved three to this kind of moment where the proof is obtained what happens next? Well, so so the Germans had um, they were very Germanic about this, and they they had they had redundancies in their backup systems, and they didn't just have this one beam system. This was merely the first. And when it was discovered, um, some fairly hasty countermeasures, and then quite better countermeasures were put in place. And by the autumn of 1940, this first system, which was called Knickerbein, um, had been largely defeated. Um, but there was another system, and this system went sort of unnoticed. It was in the hands of an elite group of pathfinders, and their job was to drop incendiary bombs so that others could come in. And uh, they did so using this different system called Excorate, which for the, for the purpose of this podcast, it wasn't that different from Knickerbein. It still had these crossing beams, um, but it did so using instruments so rather than listening to the beeps you saw a dial that moved and it's far harder to fool a dial than a human if you've got a human listening to dots and dashes if you start playing dots and dashes all over the place they get very confused but this dial listened for specifically what it knew it needed to listen to um and at the same time as this was happening and jones was getting information for the two systems we were also getting information so there's going to be a very big raid um called Operation Moonlight Sonata on a Midland city. Um, and this was going to be led by the team of the x -Greg. And so we needed to know how to jam it. Uh, now, actually, the, there were jammers ready, raring to go, but they needed the precise technical specifications of, of x in order to jam it. So that takes us to our third scene perfectly. So where are we? We are, as Ian McEwan would say, on Chesil Beach. Mm. Um, it is uh, November, uh, early November 1940, the 6th of November, and it is, for the purposes of this, eight days before Operation Moonlight Sonata, and I'm sure listeners are aware that that's, that was the Coventry bombing. Um, and one of these planes carrying this device with the little black box that gives all of the technical specifications of it was in trouble. Um, slightly ironically, for a Pathfinder aircraft, they had lost their way. They, they were completely lost. And so they looked down, they had to emergency land, and they saw Chesil Beach, which is a, a thin white strip from above. It looks very, very sensible place to land. It's actually a, a bloody awful place to land. It's it's a sh big shingle beach with a massive bank of shingle pushed up by the tide. And you could imagine how it would just tear off the undercarriage and the wheels um and that is indeed you know what happened it was a crash landing it went badly one of the crew died uh the rest was sufficiently shaken up that they didn't destroy this black box um and what happened next is you know deeply blackly comic um the there are, there are several accounts they they differ slightly but they all sort of agree as well it landed on the edge of the beach. It came to rest on the edge of the beach. It was half in, half out of the beach. Um, part of it in water, part of it not. The army turned up, requisition it, and pull it on. But shortly afterwards, the navy turned up. And the army claimed, this is on land, it's army property. And the navy claimed, this is on sea, it's navy property. And whilst they argued about who had the right to you know, deal with this this massive prize that contained the secrets that could potentially confound Operation Moonlit Sonata. The tide came in, and it started washing over the thing, and it presumably helped to the Navy's case because it was becoming more and more Navy as the as the tide proceeded. But did not help those who were trying to retrieve what was inside. And over the next eight days, uh, this box was not examined in the way that it should have been. And of course, on November the 14th, um, the Pathfinders arrived. They 
dropped their incendiary bombs exactly where they should be. Uh, the rest of the bomber force came in and they demolished Coventry. They created the, this beautiful medieval city that was ceased to be. And, you know, I think we've all seen the pictures of the ruined cathedral and understand that this was the first great attempt to validate one of the great theories of the 30s, which was that you could break a population's will simply through aerial bombardment. Um, and But just before, just before the raid, um, Reginald Jones had been asked what settings should we use on the jammers. And he had to guess. They could listen out for the beams and they had rough frequencies. And he guessed the frequencies. And there's a frequency that you set it at. And then there's a separate thing, which is the, the modulation frequency within it. And he gave the frequencies. And the next morning he woke up and he thought, God, I guess the, I guess the frequency is wrong. But then he went and... A few days later, just too late, they had examined the, the salt-ridden, rusted black box taken from underwater on that plane. And it turned out the modulation frequency, which he had nothing to do with, was wrong. And if they'd known it, they'd have got the jammers right. Would they have stopped Coventry? It's a great historical what, what if. We, we don't know. It was a moonlit night. Um, it was, there were many reasons why it would have probably been easy to find anyway, but you know, it's a what if precisely because a series of unfortunate incompetent events meant that uh, meant that they screwed up. You um, you write about this with an incredible amount of drama in the book, the lead up to Operation Moonlight Sonata. Sonata, and I'm just going to quote a bit of your own writing back to you when you say it was six p.m. on the 14th, and there was no time for Jones to. Um, get a second opinion. The fate of a Midland city, the exact location was still being determined and all rested on his answer. It was a most diabolical bit of gambling, as you can imagine, he said, because if one's wrong, perhaps 500 people are dead in the morning. It's an incredibly grave thought. Um, but one which I suppose loops us back around to where we were about 50 minutes ago or so when we were talking about the role of mathematics. I mean, th there are machines that can can do this now, of course, but but back then it was absolutely crucial. And this um this idea of um just the cold, quiet room and the importance of the calculation, you know, yeah. it's like an abstraction from real life, but it actually bears so importantly upon it. It does, and and you know you say you say a machine could do it now. Actually, a lot of what he did was, you know, it wasn't it wasn't the the equations that were that were wrong. It was it was thinking analytically, thinking mathematically. Um, it was sort of a Fermi problem on the Germans. It was there will be this constraint, this constraint, this constraint. Now I might have the frequency of tuning of my we said we'd return to it of my my piano wrong. I might have the population of Bristol wrong, but I can get better on all of those things and you can eventually iterate to it. But if you break down the problem, if you think scientifically, if you think mathematically, you can break it down, it becomes tractable. And that's what he was doing. But yeah, the um, the pressure on this young Jones, and by this stage he had one other assistant, um, every night he was the one working out where the Germans were going to attack. And... I, I guess you have to be both aware and not aware of the gravity of it, because if you spend your whole time thinking 500 people are going to die, I would imagine you'd, you'd go mad. And there's this wonderful scene, in fact, uh, or scene, I'm describing this book, this wonderful thing that happened um, where they discovered on Christmas Eve that the German, as, as he puts it, the, the Germans were going to be celebrating in traditional style by not bombing us. Uh, and they realised they had a day off. Um, and they all went, re reading not terribly far behind it, between the lines, they just all went to the pub and got absolutely hammered, um, and he sort of played the the harmonica, and they had a good good, good sing-along, but you're sort of reminded that they, they just had so little pressure valves and so so much needed them. It's a real thought. A last question for you. If... Um... I gave you the opportunity to bring some object back from the year 1940 
that you could um, add to your collection of little instruments that you might have around. I don't know if you have a collection, but you could start one if not. Um, is there anything you'd like that you could gaze upon and think of Jones and that story? You know, the thing, the thing I'd like, and I don't know if it exists, um, I would love his wife's diary. <laughs> I would love to find out, to have a view of him from outside of him from someone who knows him really well because it's weird writing a book you know I spent two years immersed in his life um, and you get glimpses of him from other people occasionally often admiring um, you know um, Ch Churchill was a, a massive fan he says you know he's, he's more worthy of respect than many who are glittering with trinkets at the end of the war when when Jones left scientific intelligence without being able to talk about his career with no academic credentials to his name and tried to get a job in Aberdeen um Churchill personally intervened and you know went up to Aberdeen and just said you've got to employ this man the man who broke the bloody beams um uh so plenty of Martin plenty thought him annoying but I would love that personal I'd love to flick through it and see the personal insight of, of someone who I would imagine found him deeply exasperating as well, but also also loved him. Lots for us to think about. Well, listen, Tom Whipple, on behalf of myself, our listeners and all the piano tuners of Bristol, thanks for coming on our little podcast. It's been a wonderful hour of conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Tom Whipple, who is the author of this book, The Battle of the Beams, the secret science of radar that turned the tide of World War II. Of course, the character right at the heart of it, as we've been saying, is R.V. Jones, and he alone is, um, I suppose, worth the admission fee. More as ever on our website at tttpodcast.com. Thanks for watching today. More coming very soon. Goodbye. <laughs>